Borola, Borola, Pope, Croisoi, Dachlif, Levinel, Raymond Williams. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the annual Raymond Williams lecture. My Chlosochun Ichabiliant of Leuden is a highlight of my year, and even more so this year as we celebrate a um, joint centenary. It's the centenary of the birth of Raymond Williams and the centenary of the Learning and Working Work Institute. Ruin Valko Galoni, well, the Drossa Dross Digant on Hiyama Gadania Boroma. I'm so glad that there are over 200 people here today uh, to share uh, the celebration with us. And welcome, Krozi Maori, Hevid, Erica Brooks, and Nick Mani, Zephilthia de Raymond Williams. And uh, welcome to Erica Brooks and uh, Nick Mani from the Mahoney from the uh, Raymond Williams uh, Foundation. Raymond Williams, as you know, um, was a novelist, a cultural critic, social intellectual, and adult educator. Born not so far from where I am, actually, uh, in Pandi near Abergavenny, about six miles down the road from um, where, where I am. He was born into a working class family. His father, a railway worker, uh, like mine, actually, uh, also, his father was also secretary of the local um, Labour Party. Having studied at Cambridge, he became a tutor for the WEA, which is the Workers' Education Association, as you know. It's interesting, you know, that um, for Raymond Williams, the notion of education and intellectualism um, was central to the Welsh Valley community, as it was indeed when I started teaching in the mining village of uh, Oakdale in the Sahari Valley. Now, Raymond Williams commented on Wales's unique cultural climate, that symbiotic relationship between intellectuals and manuals work, manual workers. You saw it in Oakdale Mines Institute, which is now uh, in St. Fagans. And in his own words, you know, he said there was absolutely no sense in which education was felt as something curious to the community. There was absolutely nothing wrong with being bright, winning a scholarship or writing a book. And that's true, you know, historically, you know, the Welsh intellectuals have come uh, in very much larger numbers from poor families than the English uh, equivalents. So the movement into intellectual life is not regarded as abnormal or eccentric uh, here in Wales. And in fact, the typical Welsh intellectual, again, these are Raymond Williams words, the typical Welsh intellectual is, as we say, only one generation away from, uh, from shirt sleeves. The second centenary is that of uh, the Learning and Work Institute. NIAS, the predecessor, was founded in 1921 as the British Institute of Adult Education and was dedicated to advocating for and promoting adult learners learning. And that's what we're still doing here at the Learning and Work Institute in England uh, and Wales. And it remained the advocacy body for adult learning in England and Wales, probably the largest body of such body uh, in the world. I, I think it is, and I, I believe it is. Uh, it is. On in January 2016, we took um, as nice. We took a decision to merge with the Centre for Economic and Social Inclusion, and that formed a new organisation which we have here today, the Learning and Work Institute. But those two organisations they bring the principles of Raymond Williams, the principles of nice of adult education, and they bring the principles of employment policy together in one organisation. And those principles uh, of Raymond Williams and the practice of the Learning Work Institute are indeed central to our session today. This is our 21st lecture, and I'm delighted today to be joined uh, by Kirsty Williams, the Minister for Education. And following the Minister, the, the keynote lecture will be given by Professor Tim Blackman, uh, the Vice Chancellor of, of the Open University. And then we will have a panel discussion chaired by David Hagendijk uh, from the Learning and Work Institute. On the panel, we will have uh, Tim Blackman himself, uh, Kirsty, the minister, Maggie Galliers, who is the chair of the Learning and Work Institute, Mark Jones, uh, principal of uh, Gower College, and Emma Williams, the inspirational adult learner of the year um, last year. 
the event will be recorded and I believe one of my colleagues will put the a hashtag, which is a hashtag RW Lecture 2021 into the chat term for you. Throughout the lecture, we're keen for audience participation. So please post questions to the panel during the lecture and, and like the posted questions. So that gives an idea of the top 10 questions for the panel. But I think, you know, is uh, off we go. I welcome Kirsty Williams, the Minister for um, Education uh, for Wales to open this, um, this lecture, Kirsty. Good morning, everybody. And it is great to be with you, virtually at least, uh, today. I am sure that we are all in for a treat hearing from Tim, Professor Blackman, and perhaps how he sees the future for lifelong learning, learning and the opportunities it brings, not just for individuals, but also for a better society and democracy. Of course, as the Vice Chancellor of the Open University, he might have a head start on the rest of us in adapting his teaching and lecture style in the age of Zooms, Teams, Skype, and the million other platforms that we have all had to grapple with over the last year. The OU, as many of you will know, was once the University of the Air, as imagined by Harold Wilson. These days, most institutions have had to become universities of the cloud, but all can still learn much from the OU's work in how it delivers, supports, and works across different media. I can't help but wonder what Raymond Williams would make of it all. He was, of course, a keen thinker and scrutineer of mass media, communications, and their educational reach and influence. In many ways, perhaps, we are now seeing the bringing down of the privileges and barriers that he identified as being inherent in the English, if not quite British, educa education system that was tied to reinforcing class and societal hierarchies. It would be, of course, remiss not to mention what we have done as a government in the spirit of the wrong revolution. I truly believe that our reforms have moved the Welsh system away from a blinkered focus just on full-time undergraduates, remembering that just four in 10 of our students are not full-time undergraduates. And we have successfully delivered a student finance system where full-time undergraduates, part-time undergraduates and postgraduates can get the equivalent support in grants and loans. I'm so pleased that our part-time numbers continue to go up after the introduction of the reforms. And if you look at the OU, for example, since our reforms, their Welsh part-time student numbers have gone up by 85%. Getting to grips with progression to postgraduate has been a particular personal priority. We had seen a very unfortunate decade of decline in Wales prior to 2016. In my time in office, introducing grants and loans, plus further bursaries and STEM subjects, first year Welsh postgrads have increased by over one third. These reforms have helped us to widen access, to bring more diversity onto campuses, and I hope to spark long-term changes in access to the professions, academia, and community regeneration. Now I know that Tim has his own thoughts on the role of academic selection at universities, the development of a comprehensive system and ensure, ensuring greater diversity in learning environments across the United Kingdom. If I may say so, he has been a bit of a soothsayer on these issues. Our context of the last year, right across the four nations, has challenged some very long held certainties. Without sitting A-level examinations, universities were and are happy to be agile in their student admissions. This surely is the time to be asking those longer term questions on a different admissions architecture and not just limited to when students apply. Indeed, I'm keen that in Wales we took a long hard look at which exams we sit, when they are sat, for what purpose, in what subjects, and their relationship with an entitlement to lifelong learning. I worry that there may be too much conservatism in all of our education systems to tackle these head on, but the last few months have shown that convictions can change quickly and decisively when the opportunity comes. And I'm sure that Tim will have some of his own answers to these challenges in his remarks this morning. So friends, let me introduce, let, let me introduce him to you formally so that he can enlighten us all. Professor Tim Blackman joined the Open University as the Vice-Chancellor 
in October 2019, having been VC at Middlesex University before that. Of course, it was a return to the OU where he had previously been PVC for research and quality. Tim has a lot in common with my colleague and boss, the First Minister, both the professors of social policy with experience of community and social work before becoming academics. Tim is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and the Royal Society of Arts. And he's also co-founded co charitable enterprises such as Community Technical Aid and the Oxford Dementia Centre. It is my great pleasure to introduce this year's Raymond Williams Memorial Lecture delivered by Professor Tim Blackman. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty, for that um, that really generous introduction and for all the uh, work that you've done for education and for the support you've given to the OU. Well, good morning, everybody, and um, happy new year. I think we can still welcome the new year on the 1st of February. After 2020, it's a hopeful year, um, but for now, I hope that you and your families are well and managing in these very difficult times. Thank you for joining the lecture this morning. Uh, thank you especially to the Learning and Work Institute for inviting me to give it, and to Louise Casella and my colleagues at OU Cymru for supporting the event. It's a real honor to give this lecture, not only to follow such distinguished speakers in previous years, and I'm delighted that one of them, Minister Kirsty Williams, is joining us this morning, but also because it is in memory of Raymond Williams, who has had a huge influence on how many of us think about politics, culture, the media, and literature. I was first introduced to his work by my PhD supervisor, Professor David Byrne at Durham University in the early 1980s. I found his writing profound and challenging. The ideas are challenging, and his work is quite challenging to read, often complex and nuanced. His novels are easier reads, but still explore the same themes of solidarity, community and ecology that he was concerned about throughout his whole working life. Raymond Williams was several things, but above all, a teacher. There's a theory of education running through his large and diverse body of work. This theory is summed up in a term he used in an essay published in 1961 called The Common Good, where he writes of, to quote, the process of society as itself a process of education. So it's been a good thing to do, knowing I needed to prepare this lecture to connect some of the agendas we face at the Open University with his thinking. In particular, what I want to do over the next 45 minutes or so is to explore whether there is a common purpose for tertiary education, adult education as Raymond Williams would have called it. It might seem strange to ask that question when across the UK nations, we are in many respects seeing a convergence of further and higher education as they have both come to focus on skills acquisition for employment. But although, although we've seen really since the 1980s, the development of much more systematic and detailed prescribing of the knowledge and skills required of students on both vocational and academic courses in the form of frameworks and standards, this has largely been done separately for vocational and academic education. And paradoxically, just when more and more of these knowledge and skill requirements overlap because of a common focus on employability, we're seeing a sharper divide in policy between courses based on occupational standards and courses based on academic disciplinary criteria, which is often called liberal education to distinguish it from training for specific jobs. I'm gonna suggest that this is an issue for both social and economic reasons, socially, because social distinctions notions of social worth are still embedded in this distinction between vocational and liberal education, especially between colleges and universities. Economically, because the attributes conventionally associated with vocational and liberal education 
are converging in terms of what actual professional jobs demand. These jobs need a certain level of technical competency, including fast emerging ones like coding. But what are regarded conventionally as academic skills like critical thinking, integrated thinking and research are becoming more important in professional jobs as routine technical competencies are increasingly handed over to machines. For example, as data capabilities grow, such as pattern recognition, the ability to develop hypotheses, to see problems and solutions holistically, or to use data ethically become more important. These are very academic skills, although not, of course, solely academic skills. I've had the opportunity to be close to the very recent policy developments in England as a member of the FE White Paper Stakeholder Advisory Group. And I want to draw on that, but there's also real value in looking at this through a four nations lens, which is something we routinely do at the OU as the UK's only four nations university. That brings with it an ability to contrast and compare while recognizing that the national contexts are different politically and to a significant extent culturally. Communal values, for example, play a more significant role in Welsh public policy than in England. These cross-national comparisons raise an interesting question as to whether we're seeing a difference in degree or a difference substantially, a substantive difference. All four nations distinguish between vocational and academic education, but in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, they tend to be regarded as complementary and the policy language is one of collaboration. In England, the policy narrative is one of highlighting the differences and aiming explicitly to grow vocational education and in relative terms, scale back the growth of academic education, more engineering and less media studies. There's interestingly, a new language of collaboration in the white paper, but within vocational education rather than between vocational and academic education. So in England, the new T levels, higher apprenticeships and now higher technical qualifications are to be alternatives to degrees based on tightly prescribed occupational standards and pathways. Degrees, it is argued, are a mixed bag, especially if you study at a less select selective institution or a less selective subject, while technical qualifications will make you job ready. Raymond Williams saw vocational education and training as important, but believed that specialist vocational training should only occur after a common liberal education. Vocational training, he commented, was best done at the bench. He would have been a supporter of apprenticeships, but not at the cost of apprentices lacking a common liberal education. That education for Williams needed to be for everyone and about developing what he called critical consciousness. This is essentially the political consciousness necessary for a healthy participatory democracy in which what you regard as true is not as it has increasingly become a reflection of which side of a political or social divide you identify with, but the outcome of a common educational experience. So let me start with a recollection from my previous institution, Middlesex University in London. Sir Michael Partridge, who was permanent secretary at the Department of Social Security in the early 1990s, was a pro-chancellor at Middlesex when I was vice-chancellor. And he used to include some advice about careers in his speech when he was presiding at our graduation ceremonies. He started by remarking that his classics degree from Oxford might be seen these days as relevant to little more than becoming a Mediterranean tour guide. He went on, of course, to celebrate the merits of a classics education how it enriches the imagination, develops cultural and social literacy and citizenship and abilities in argumentation and communication. He was after all living proof of what a classics degree could get you. While the message about the virtues of a liberal education was important in a diverse post-1992 university like Middlesex, I did wonder what our graduates made of hearing about the virtues of a degree subject that was quite far from anything we actually offered at Middlesex, where, the, where we focused both on 
what appeared relevant to professional employment and what was in demand from school and college applicants. Classics was not in demand, a reflection of how it's been abandoned in state schools, but perhaps also a reflection of how young people felt their culture was not reflected in classics, that it was not relevant to them, not ordinary. Raymond Williams is perhaps best known for the argument that culture is indeed ordinary. It is not in its fullest sense to be found among the dreaming spires of Oxford, but in the everyday lives of ordinary people. This doesn't mean that the classics are not to be found in ordinary culture because they are, which could be the subject for another lecture that others would be much more qualified than me to give. But a striking example is from a part of the country that I know well, County Durham. When the mines were open, the local trade unions, the lodges, made banners that displayed messages about their cause, often paraded to the accompaniment of brass bands. This still continues in the form of the annual Durham Miners Gala. The messages include such things as labour and peace, fellowship is life, fellowship for all, the past we inherit, the future we forge. The banners are works of art, and although the pits are now long closed, new and renewed banners are still made and put on show, show in community centres and other venues. The OU historian, Dr. Richard Marsden, pointed me to Swansea University's online exhibition of the South Wales Miners Lodge banners. The messages on those banners showed just how much the miners of Durham and South Wales had a common political outlook with themes of world peace, equality, brotherhood, and international solidarity. Indeed, that these communities had so much in common reflects Raymond Williams's own perspective on Welsh communalism, that it has been a product of a specific history rather than of some racial or cultural essence. We also see across the mining communities of Durham and South Wales, the same appetite for education, both self-organized and through participation in local authority and university adult education classes. In fact, Louise has suggested to me that you could argue the OU itself came out of this movement. And I think there's a lot to that. Jenny Lee, the minister who drove creating the OU as a university for everyone, was the daughter of a Scottish miner. And her husband was an RM Bevan, whose great achievement was the National Health Service. While Jenny Lee graduated from Edinburgh University in 1927 with a teacher's diploma and a law degree, Anaran Bevan left school at 13 to go down the pits and credited, credited his education to the Tredegar Working Man's Library. While Bevan was reading Marx in his local Working Man's Library, many other miners were more interested in classics. In their book, A People's History of Classics, Edith Hall and Henry Stead chose as the frontispiece a photograph of the banner of the Fenhall Drift Lodge in Lanchester, which was made in 1960. A 20th century miner is depicted next to a Roman soldier. The miners of the Durham and Northumberland coalfield learned about Roman Britain. It was part of their culture because it was part of their place. We're talking about the land of Hadrian's Wall. In the 1920s, classics was a very popular subject in Durham University's extramural classes, where nearly half of the students were manual labourers and a third of them miners. Did studying classics make them better miners? I think it probably did. Indeed, the coal owners encouraged participation and, of course, had their own agenda for doing that. Raymond Williams, in his essay, Culture is Ordinary, explains working class culture as a way of life in which what matters is neighbourhood, mutual obligation and common betterment. But fast forward from when he was writing in the late 1950s to 2017, and we find the journalist and author David Goodhart problematising these values as paradoxically a source of division in contemporary Britain. In his book, The Road to Somewhere, The Populist Revolt and the Future of Politics, Goodhart writes about what he sees as the great divide. Here's what he says. 
The old distinctions of class and economic interest have not disappeared, but are increasingly overlaid by a larger and looser one between the people who see the world from anywhere and the people who see it from somewhere. Anywheres dominate our culture and society. They tend to do well at school, then usually move from home to a residential university in their late teens and on to a career in the professions that might take them to London or even abroad for a year or two. Such people have portable achieved identities based on educational and career success, which makes them generally comfortable and confident with new places and people. He continues, somewheres are more rooted and usually have ascribed identities, Scottish farmer, working class Geordie, Cornish housewife, based on group belonging and particular places, which is why they often find rapid change unsettling. One core group of the somewheres have been called the left behind, mainly older white working class men with little education. They have lost economically with the decline of well-paid jobs for people without qualifications and culturally too, with the marginalization of their views in the public conversation. There are strong resonances here with Williams's work, especially his novels and what is often regarded as the most Welsh of them, The Fight for Mannard, which is a story of an anywhere new town being planned for the somewhere communities of mid Wales. The book explores aspects of a key concept in Williams's work, structures of feeling. This is a term that tries to capture how the way people think and the way people feel are intertwined in shared ways and how these become communal because they are reflections of common material circumstances and histories. The boundaries between structures of feeling are fuzzy. They are, in Williams's words, in solution and in process rather than precipitated. They can be dominant, emergent or residual. Goodhart's two cultures are structures of feeling. They fit pretty closely with how Britain divided in the EU referendum and map to the divide in certain values, attitudes and outlooks of graduates and non-graduates, such as on immigration, the welfare state or crime. They share much in common, but importantly, there is much that separates them. Politics and public policy can either deepen this separation, indeed exploit it, or create common ground. A concern I have here with the direction of education policy in England is that it could deepen this division, but it's early days and there's still much being shaped in how, new, in how England's new policies will work out. They represent a rebalancing of the hege hegemony of the anywheres in tertiary education policy to a focus on the needs and interests of good hearts somewheres. English policymaking is now celebrating the role of local further education colleges after years of neglect, clearly the right thing to do. But it's also arguing it's time to end the privileged status of the university honours degree, both as an aspiration and in terms of general funding and time to create opportunity for the left behind. This is not to be done by continuing the expansion of degree education, but by incentivizing alternatives, specifically apprenticeships, T-levels and higher technical qualifications. This it's argued will address the large gap by international standards in workers qualified with shorter higher vocational qualifications than degrees known as level four and five qualifications, where it's argued there are significant skill shortages. This is also a response to the more contentious claim that there is an overproduction of degrees. Unlike Scotland, where there's still significant level four and five provision through higher nationals, the intention is England, in England appears to be that there should not be a common progression, commonly taken progression pathway to degrees as they are in Scotland, but they should, but that they should be credentials for direct entry into the workforce. Whether this will work depends firstly on popular aspiration and secondly on employers. The aspiration among mothers for their children to attend university is very high with various surveys putting this at between 70% and 95%. This compares with a current 18 year old entry rate of 38% in England, 31% in Wales, 
and 28% in Scotland. Although these, these figures don't include higher education in further education colleges. The aspiration gap is huge and much more so for some geographies and socioeconomic groups that are held back by prior attainment at level two and three, the GCSE and A-level or BTEC stages. Many who do not progress straight after school or college to a degree course do so later in life, when level three attainment is not such a barrier. There is still huge latent demand among adults, although the financial obstacles to study, especially in England, are considerable and prevent much of this demand from materialising. The 2018 improvements in maintenance support for part-time study in Wales have demonstrated what latent demand there is among adult learners, bringing about a very large increase in participation in degree study, now with proper support for fees and living costs. And I'd like to pay tribute to Kirsty Williams for what she's achieved with ensuring that these measures make a difference to thousands of lives. And at the OU, we've been privileged to work with such determined political leadership. This evidence that the aspiration for higher education is so widespread means that the lack of graduates among good hearts somewheres is unlikely to reflect negative cultural attitudes towards higher education, but the effects of economic disadvantage on earlier attainment, although ethnic, gender and place factors mediate this effect. It remains a paradox of UK education that despite an overwhelmingly non-selective secondary education and college system, higher education is so selective. Access for 18 and 19 year olds is dependent on achievement at level three and admission grades for the same subject vary dramatically from institution to institution creating a prestige ranking. Somewheres who do manage to make it to university are largely confined to institutions in the lower positions of this ranking. While academic selection is common in other national systems, the UK's are more selective than most. The Open University is in fact the only non-selective university in the UK and the social profile of its mainly adult students is broadly similar to the adult population of the UK as a whole. Most of the Russell group is hyper-selective with a very different profile. The selectivity of degree study may, however, be an important reason for its popularity, including among employers who value, perhaps even more than the technical content, the way degrees signal other productivity and social characteristics of the degree holder including that they actually completed a substantial and challenging programme of study. Thus, official classifications may not, for example, classify a personal assistant role as requiring a degree, but many employers will attach value to hiring a PA with a degree. Indeed, they may transform the role as has tended to happen with PA roles transitioning more to business managers as technology supports the more basic tasks like scheduling appointments, and convening meetings. And one of the reasons why PAs and business managers are increasingly graduates is that young women's participation in higher education is significantly higher than young men's. And these are roles traditionally associated with women. The growing gender differential in higher education participation raises a whole set of other issues from it being, a de from it being degree courses that are predominantly studied by women that become labeled as low value to the bifurcation of academic and technical education routes, risking greater occupational segregation and gender pay gaps. One thing new graduates, both young and adult learners often do not appreciate is that while their degree can be very important in achieving the initial step into a professional job or a career change, over time, the degree becomes less important because what comes to matter more is past performance in the job what you've done and what you've accomplished. This doesn't mean the degree is unimportant. In many ways, it's this later performance that employers are trying to predict in using a degree as a proxy for potential. And as evidence, they're right. The more graduates a business has in its workforce, the more innovative it is likely to be. Recent UK government research shows that firms that are innovating both have more graduate employees and are hiring more of them in all subject areas, not just science, engineering, and technology. 
the traditional degree is still the dominant currency in the professional jobs market. But UK government and more specifically treasury concern has been growing about how the expense of a predominantly full-time multi-year once and for all qualification as participation rates continue to rise and probably will continue to do so as a function of both student and employer demand, how the expense of that trend should be controlled. This is particularly an issue in England where there's normally no cap on undergraduate numbers. This is probably one of the reasons why in the UK government's recent interim response to the Augur review, the proposal for minimum entry requirements that would make degree education more selective are still being kept on the table. The focus of concerns with the rising cost of higher education has been almost, almost entirely on the public subsidy to teaching, whether fee loan or grant. The cost of maintenance support for students who choose to live away from home is little discussed. I don't have the Welsh figure, but maintenance loans in England are expected to reach nine billion pounds per annum by 2024, with half never repaid. A huge proportion of this goes to residential higher education and to student landlords. Residential higher education was a model created for an elite system that's now very expensive as a mass system, benefiting, benefiting the students of anywhere families far more than somewheres who often study locally, which in many other countries is the typical study pattern. The UK is unusual, but the residential model is associated with higher completion rates and despite its expense, still delivers a positive net return with the extra earnings and taxes paid over a working lifetime. Much has been made of the small fall in the graduate earnings premium in recent years, yet the remarkable thing is how the premium is held up as the number of graduates in the workforce has increased. Degrees have spread wealth. Also, despite the extent to which the public subsidy to higher education varies across the four UK nations, in every nation, there's a net exchequer return on this investment. Public spending on higher education is a good investment, generating innovation, raising productivity and increasing tax yields. Criticisms of the dominance of degrees have therefore focused not on averages, but on the outcomes of different degree subjects. This is a strong part of the narrative in England, but interestingly, hardly at all in the other nations. The data are fraught with interpretation issues. Are comparisons between subjects genuinely like with like? What is professional employment? And what stage in a working lifetime is the right one to fix a measure of employment outcome? The current measure is 15 months after graduation. At that time, I was in what was then a non-graduate job as a community worker, but I'm now a vice chancellor. Nevertheless, the differences in professional employment outcomes are striking. By subject, this ranges from 90% in professional employment 15 months after graduation to less than 40%. There's also marked variation by institution and the same subject can have very different outcomes. Engineering, for example, ranges from less than 30% in professional employment to nearly 90%, depending on the institution. There's much less data available for outcomes from higher vocational qualifications. And there often seems to be an assumption that these all lead to highly skilled jobs. This is largely untested to the extent that degree outcomes have been scrutinized. The recent English Skills White Paper cites a little misleadingly one study that identified a better earnings premium from level four and five qualifications than degrees. But the data were very limited and the authors draw no firm conclusions. These data, however, cannot be ignored by universities. The outcomes students achieve from completing their programmes will increasingly be visible to applicants, advisors and employers. That these outcomes may also be associated with prior attainment, family background, school attended or institutional prestige that's not associated with any actual differences in the quality of education is likely to be of little interest to employers for whom an outcome is an outcome. Data capabilities are also likely to take this trend further with modern HR systems able to track what institutions and qualifications are most strongly associated with successful appointments. LinkedIn already has this capability to a significant extent. 
Raymond Williams, in many ways, saw this coming. He understood how the increasing data capabilities of societies would have a growing influence on policymaking. He warned, too, in his book, Towards 2000, about adult education systems simply being aligned to the constant drive for short-term competitive advantage that he saw as characteristic of capitalist economies, leading to wage growth falling behind a growing concentration of value in assets and capital, and ultimately to ecological catastrophe. He was critical of education as training because it didn't develop the popular critical consciousness that avoiding these crises needed. But he was also deeply critical of what he described as, to quote, something called academic education. This was because the term implied limits, not least that it's, it's, it is possible to reach the limit of the educable. For him, there are no such limits. The important limit was, to quote, the relevance of the learning that happens to be available to what you want to learn. His commitment, though, was to much more than open education. It was to learning as making social change. Yet he was very conscious that this should not mean ideological indoctrination. He uses, he uses an interesting quote from William Cobbett in making this point. When Cobbett donated five pounds, a substantial sum in the early 19th century, to one of the early mechanics institutes, Cobbett said, mechanics, I most heartily wish you well, but I most heartily wish you not to be humbugged, which you most certainly will be if you suffer anybody but real mechanics to have anything to do in managing the concern. You will mean well, but many a cunning scoundrel will get place or pension as the price of you. Education, or specifically adult education, was not for Williams a mission of remedying a deficit by the learned bringing learning to the ignorant, but a mission of co-creation in which the experience of the learner in work and in wider society was as important and valid as the knowledge of the teacher. Williams thought that adult education had to have a relationship with universities, but he was critical of a model of universities where they are the heartland of knowledge, a heartland that, to quote, defines what learning is, deems what a subject is and what it's not, knows what is evidence and what is not. He was concerned that the idea of a general education that raises social consciousness would be usurped by what he called training for jobs. When, as he put it, the industrial trainers arrived, life became difficult for who he saw as the true public educators, the new humanists. The new humanists could build real consciousness, real understanding of the world. I think this is where Williams got it wrong, distinguishing in this way between academic and technical education, between humanist education and what he called rather pejoratively industrial training. Today, the latter means courses based on occupational standards, learning to be a social worker, a tool process design engineer, or a creative digital design professional. In England, the direction of travel is now firmly towards a common funding and student support regime across higher vocational and academic learning. And this looks likely in Wales too. In Wales, however, there's a stronger commitment to putting the learner at the centre and therefore recognising that pathways need to be flexible and permeable. We might call this the climbing frame model. In England, there's a strong focus on putting the employer at the centre with higher vocational education based on linear and impermeable occupational pathways so that learners are fully occupational competent, occupationally competent and academic education is increasingly judged on its professional employment outcomes. We might call this the ladder model. Climbing frame and ladder models may be becoming the new types of difference we see in tertiary education systems across the world. But what we are generally not seeing is the extent to which English policy is differentiating between academic and vocational education. I feel this reflects an essentially 20th century mindset. It's even echoed in the English preference for the term technical rather than vocational education, harking back to the technical schools of the 1960s. Then arguably, it was more plausible to regard head and hand 
professional and manual jobs as separate and requiring different types of education. But this is much less the case now. Those who went into the professions in the last century often first enjoyed a liberal education at university. Part of the reason for that is because a liberal education was useful for more complex jobs. I do agree with Sir Michael Partridge about that. However, as more jobs become professional in advanced services economies, and as the content of those jobs changes due to automation, we can't afford to lose in today's workplaces the attributes conventionally associated with liberal education. Technology is not replacing human skills, but putting a premium on skills that are uniquely human rather than machine-like, such as leadership, teamwork, empathetic communication, and complex problem solving. Labour market needs are not only and increasingly not defined by separate training silos of occupational standards, but by the hybrid job market, with roles that blend two or more occupational competencies, such as analytics and marketing. This is where there could be a real danger with creating at tertiary level separate degree and sub-degree qualification routes if they are largely insulated from each other in terms of credit transfer, module mixes and progression. This is especially the case if the degree route remains as socially exclusive as it still is. I think it's extremely important that occupational competencies are defined and can be assembled into qualifications. But these competencies overlap much more than suggested by separate occupational standards, including with the content of so-called academic degrees. And it's not always necessary to achieve every competency in a standard to be job ready. Employers are also looking to be able to pick the right training for the right people at the right time. With this work-based, something that came out strongly from a Chambers Wales webinar that Louise chaired recently. But employers may not have a long-term view or a broad view when learners may have. They are likely to want to be able to cross the worlds of technical and academic education, if not now, then later in their lives, out of curiosity or out of need. Here is what beauty entrepreneur Sharmadine Reed said about this in the OU's Life on Our Terms podcast series. She said, I'm constantly doing courses because it gives me my competitive advantage to have knowledge in adjacent areas. So I actually do courses in philosophy and I'll do a course in human behavioral biology. I did economics because that was a big gap in my knowledge. Denmark is one of the happiest countries in the world. Its school system focuses on developing children's self-confidence and personality. An important way this is done is to teach all children a mix of academic and technical competences, cooking, mechanics and sewing, as well as maths and languages. None of these are valued more than others. No talents are valued more than other talents. So all children develop with confidence in something that they're good at, and many of them realise they can be good at all of them. It's encouraging to see plans for the new school curriculum in Wales reflect some of this thinking. However, students specialise in Denmark between academic and technical routes as they progress through the system, which is still a marked feature of most European systems. But the future is Asia, where we are seeing academic and vocational streams of education coming closer together, including a lessening of the social class segregation typically found in more siloed systems in the West. Singapore, for example, has reformed its vocational education so that it offers similar progression to university as academic routes. Neither do we have to think in terms of either or, of a trade or a profession. Switzerland promotes vocational routes with strap lines like, train to be a hairdresser, become a biologist. In Australia's dual sector universities, many academic graduates progress to a short vocational qualification at a lower level not because they made a mistake choosing their degree subject, but because that is what they want to do. It's possible to create these pathways while still creating opportunities to achieve full qualifications. In other words, mixing academic and vocational modules that as credit accumulates can be cashed in at, at stages for a qualification. This will be something similar to the OU's open certificates, diplomas and degrees. It needs good information, advice and guidance though. This is the promise of England's new lifelong learning, lifelong learning loan allowance, funding 480 credits of tertiary learning 
over a lifetime. But there are still unresolved contradictions between this aspiration and the position that academic and technical programs should be separate and impermeable in terms of credit accumulation and transfer, hybrid programs and progression. More flexibility would also allow more responsiveness as technology changes and new challenges emerge at an accelerating pace. Occupational standards, for example, are already having to catch up with the growing demand for green skills as economies shift to more sustainable production. Raymond Williams had some important ideas about this too, and they've helped me to craft the conclusion to this lecture, which I'm now going to move on to. He saw improvements in production, durability, higher quality, greater economy, as crucial to resolving the ecological crisis that he saw ahead. But fundamentally, he looks to a different type of society, a future where instead of, as he puts it, society as production, society is about the emotional rewards of human relationships. In the full sense, a way of life. Let's return to that phrase I mentioned at the start, the process of society as itself a process of education. There could be no way of life without education and the type of education really matters. Germany in the 1920s had what was widely regarded to be one of the best education systems in the world, but it was authoritarian and hierarchical. It not only did not prevent the rise of Nazism, but it helped to create the conditions for it. The emotional rewards of human relationships are well known to us, but the emotional rewards of learning perhaps are a little less understood. They are only becoming clearer scientifically from recent developments in brain science. Humans are born ready to learn and with the drive that motivates learning, curiosity. Our brains are wired to learn and to be naturally curious as a result of millions of years of evolution. We all have a brain chemistry that rewards learning, not because of what we can do with it, although that was the impetus, but which rewards us when we learn successfully. When we learn something successfully, our brain gives us a dose of dopamine, the same response as when we enjoy good food or other pleasures. That learning becomes too hard or boring as some children and teenagers unfortunately come to regard it, is largely a result of how they're schooled and taught and essentially unnatural. We are, as Alex Beard writes, natural born learners. Through learning, we find our purpose, express ourselves creatively and master the tools needed to do so lifelong. This is not different to Raymond Williams' idea of a society of rewarding human relationships because learning is social and most of what we learn, we owe to others. Importantly, we learn better if we share what we learn. In Denmark, that happiest of societies, children are taught empathy from the age of six, putting themselves in the shoes of others. And this notion of reciprocity is for me the way to resolve so much of the debate about the purposes of education. As the motto on the OU shield says, learn and live. Everyone can be more fully human by continually developing the knowledge, skills and behaviours to enter into fuller and more rewarding relationships with each other. That's the case, whether it's through what we can do as a hairdresser or a biologist, a data scientist or a classic scholar, or taking some courses in all of those. They're not really different. The Scottish philosopher, John McMurray, argued that all education, academic and vocational, is about learning how to act in ways that are purposeful and right for the intended outcome about our purposes and the success of our actions. We are acting though, in the world of other people's actions too. What Raymond Williams argues for us is to bring these purposeful actions of all of us into mutual gain. A necessity he argues, not just for well-being, but survival, to bring these purposeful actions of all of us into mutual gain. Thus, as much as technical education enables us to learn skills to create and make, and through that earn a living, we still all need the humanists because there's no practice that is not relationship-based practice. That will not be automated. There are no robots in a structure of feeling yet. 
Jenny Lee and Anarin Bevan had similar projects, universal education and universal healthcare. They didn't see healthcare and education as consumers of wealth produced elsewhere in the economy, but as themselves wealth creators, the wealth of learning and the wealth of health. Just as healthcare is about enabling both productive working lives and human well-being, so education should present no necessary choice between education for work and education for well-being. We need education for what Williams calls a way of life. The necessary task is what way of life we choose. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tim. And um, I know it was a, a, an odd way to deliver a lecture, as we discussed previously, the way you, you can't see nodding heads. There's no applause uh, from the audience and uh, there's no one to make eye contact with to, to make sure you're on the right lines. But I think there's lots and lots in there um, from this from, from your lecture, which I think resonates with um, how we, you know, how we try to approach things as learning and work institute, but also um, the, the context here um, in Wales. Um, we're going to move on to a panel. We will come to Tim last on the panel to give you a chance, Tim, to catch your breath and to um, just have, have a drink of water. But um, the panel members today we have will be um, Kirsty Williams, the Minister of Education, who you've already heard from. Uh, Mark Jones, the principal of Gower College, Swansea, trying to give an FE perspective. And uh, Maggie Galliers, uh, as mentioned previously, is both on the OU Council and is also chair of Learning and Work Institute, so straddles both the organisations. And I'm really pleased that we've got um, Emma Williams with us here as well today. Emma is um, one of our, is, is this year's Inspire Award winner um, and has got a fantastic story, which I will, I will ask her when I come to her to tell a little bit about her background and her perspective on this. Um, I was hoping, though, to come, first of all, I think, to... Um, uh, the minister. Oh, actually, before I do that, I should say, um, Tim, in the last kind of bit of your lecture, uh, you talked about classic scholars. And um, we had a message from one of your OU learners who has just started a degree, a classics degree, at the age of 74 with the Open University. So I think that probably uh, typifies the kind of mission and purpose of the OU and the kind of diverse range of learners that you have, and uh, definitely never too old to start learning. Um, so I, I will come to Kirsty, if I can, first of all, um, Kirsty, just to get to get your um, perspective, first of all, on uh, what Tim has talked about there, as someone obviously who's given the um, Raymond Williams lecture in the past, but also um, so just 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 in, in broad terms, but also is there a specific reflection you might want to make around the polarisation um, in our society and our country? and the role of adult education in trying to address some of that, where Tim talked about some ways and any ways. But I think it was something which you touched on in your Raymond Williams lecture um, a couple of years ago, I think. Well, thank you for that, David. And as you said, it's so, it's so difficult to do a lecture in, in this particular format uh, because all those, those verbal cues are not there. But can I just say, I've scribbled on a lot. So that's my equivalent of a verbal clue uh, uh, for my reaction to Tim. Lots and lots of really, really um, uh, interesting and uh, thought-provoking uh, points that was um, made. Um, uh, I think here in Wales, um, I think you know we are we are trying to establish a system that is indeed that climbing frame with the student at the heart of it. And because of COVID, you know, I, I'm. I'm deeply disappointed that we haven't been able to move forward uh, at a greater pace with our, uh, our tertiary reforms uh, here in Wales, which is about creating that environment to, to build uh, that climbing frame, students at the centre, and that ability to move seamlessly between different types uh, of education that has been described today, but, but with that goal of um, the personal fulfilment uh, as well as the ability to contribute to society, both economically uh, and in uh, uh, and in the culture of our community. Uh, I, I'm so pleased that Tim mentioned curriculum reform, because I think that's where it starts for us in Wales, in the process that we're trying to move to, towards that purpose-led uh, education uh, from, from three upwards, uh, and, uh, and recognising, you know, uh, that uh, all aspects of education are more are, are as equal as others and that's the aim of our areas of learning and experience where each of them 
is given the uh, the same weighting. I guess um, you know that's the policy intention, but we need to to change uh, how we hold our system accountable uh, to make sure that that actually happens. But I think you know, for me, you know, what we have seen during this during this pandemic once again is being is you know is making sure that we have. Uh, that people within our nation, you know, have the ability to uh, to critically think about uh, choices that politicians and others are making around them to be able to engage uh, in that um, uh, in those scientific concepts uh, and and to be able to uh, be able to move forward. And you know, some of the most dispiriting things that I've seen during this pandemic is. You know some of the again the misinformation, the fake news, the um, you know the the COVID uh, denial. Uh, but I I think you know that brings back to the point that Tim made about um, the importance of all subjects because you can understand the science and as ministers we can follow the science, but that then butts up very quickly against human behaviour. And then you need a different set of people who have got a different set, you know, a different type of understanding of how the hard facts butt up against the real life world and what people are willing and not willing to do. So, uh, you know, the pandemic has crystallized some of these things, I think, about, you know, the need for broad, broad education, uh, you know, uh, uh, the skills within the, um, the population to be able to interrogate uh, choices that people are making. Uh, but and interestingly, I, I'm going to crib if he doesn't mind. I'm going to plagiarise Tim's comments when we move forward to our stage three debate about our curriculum, because one of the most controversial parts of our new curriculum reform has focused on what we teach children about relationships and sexuality education. Now, I don't know what it says about um, Wales that most people want to talk about the sex bit. The reason why the relationship bit is first is because we understand fundamentally how important those issues around empathy that Tim talked about are going to be for individual success and, and, and the success of our nation. And nobody wants to talk about that. So I'm going to plagiarize some of Tim's speech when we talk about this at the next stages, because I think those are some really relevant points to make. But thank you, Tim, really engaging and really food for thought for policymakers like myself about how you make that, that climbing frame a reality uh, for, Welsh, for Welsh individuals uh, of all ages. Yeah, thanks, Kirsty. I thought the climbing frame uh, was, mm. was a really useful way of describing it, and um, yeah. particularly those particular people coming back into education at different stages of their lives, which um, hopefully we'll hear a bit from Emma um, in a second or two. Um, I, I, I keep dropping out, uh, which is typical, um, as I'm trying a panel and my internet keeps dropping out. So if I do drop out, um, I'm going to ask my colleague Jeff to step in if I drop out at the wrong moment. But um, I'm going to come, I think, now to Mark, if I can, Mark Jones from Gower College, Swansea just to give a kind of um, a broad FE perspective there. And um, not so much what Tim has said, but actually some of the comments that we're seeing on the, in the, on Slido on the chat, uh, talk a little bit about kind of saying that perhaps, perhaps Welsh government focuses too much on vocational education to the detriment of that kind of common liberal education. Um, as an organization from College Wales, I'm sure you're probably fed up of having to keep reminding people about colleges within the education debate. Which is not, you know, I think sort of the, the phrase and colleges is something which I think you talk about a lot. Do you, do you recognise, as well as a reflection on the, on the lecture, do you recognise that those, those, those criticisms as fair, that we focus too much on vocational education? Or have, have we got that balance about right? No, I, I don't know. I, thank you, David. Uh, first of all, Tim, David's quite right. You don't get, um, you don't get recognition, you don't get applause. So I really, really enjoyed that lesson. There was so, lecture, there was so much in there uh, that really um, uh, I recognised a lot of what was being said. And when we spent the last 12 months looking at how we do things online, blended, laptops, adaptions, centre assess grades, and determine grades as they're going to be, it's really useful to reflect on, uh, what, on what we're trying to do and why. Um, I suppose my college is a bit different, um, David, and maybe just to help put it in context. So we're a, a general FE college, but we have a significant A-level co uh, cohort. So we have 1,500 A-level, full-time A-level students. That's 
Uh, whereas a school might have one A-level group of chemistry. I have 15 groups of A-level chemistry students this year. And this distinction between academic and vocational is, is something that plays out across the college, but particularly in our Gosainan campus where A-levels is based uh, every day. Um, many parents have a, have a clear view of what they want. Uh, A-levels seen by many parents as the gold standard. And so actually, David, vocational struggles in, in some areas of the college in that people, uh, parents have got a clear idea of what they want to do. Um, but what we've tried to do across the college, and actually online learning has helped, is we've tried to mix our students up as much as we can. Online learning has given us opportunities. The children are always mixed well. Um, they've always mixed well on our, on our sports fields. Um, in our rugby team, we have two brickwork students who are the props, but I have an A-level physics student who's the hooker. The same thing happens in all of the sports, in, in performances, in choirs. But we've been able to do far more with them in, in, in recent months, uh, particularly around employability skills, bringing um, students together, um, research skills, yeah. Um, a lot of work around uh, equality and diversity, which, which Kirsty was alluding to there as well, as well as the work we do around voluntary and, and we have a student, active students union as well. So what we've tried to do is mix those children as much as we can. After all, they all know each other. They all went to the same schools. They're all great friends, but we found there's been a real benefit in mixing them. Uh, and having this divide between academia and vocational, which, which many parents want, uh, looking for, we've tried to mix that and blend it as much as we possibly can. And we think that's been really helpful. We're seeing more vocational students now going on to universities or applying to universities, uh, particularly to new levels four and five. We're seeing academic students, in, in fact, some of the really strong ones, looking to do apprenticeships and, and clearly the introduction of degree apprenticeships uh, helps there as well. Um, I do worry. I think the pandemic, as if anything, has created the, uh, an even wider gap. Uh, there are solutions in place for A-level students for this coming summer. There aren't solutions in place for vocational students as yet. Uh, and many parents of 14 and 15 year olds may well be thinking, well, maybe my child should go down an A-level route because at least I know what they're going to get um, uh, next summer. Uh, but I, So we've got work to do there as well. But that, that artificial distinction between academia and, um, and vocational, I don't think... Um, I don't think it helps at all. I think it is still there. Uh, in my college, David, it, it, the academic in, in Gosainan is incredibly strong. Parents have a view on what they want their child to do to go into the best universities. And therefore, maybe one thing that we take, and there was so much to take from what Tim said today, one thing is to do work at a, at a lower level um, in schools, raising awareness, not just talking about um, jobs and opportunities, but but really taking the children on a, on a journey, a more intensive, longer programs, maybe in the summer and the weekend, to have that more diverse culture, which I, which I think Tim was alluding to really well. So those are my, that's my reflection on one topic. There was so much in there, I could go on, on for many other things. Too. Thanks, Mark. Um, as perhaps a, what one, another area to ask you to touch on is around Tim's point about occupational kind of pathways and occupational standards. and. Perhaps they are too narrow, um, you know. And for the for, for the world of for the world of modern work, where you'll have you'll have young people leaving college and school, uh, the college rather, at eighteen, nineteen, facing decades of work. Do yeah, they, you, they are too. Do you recognise that? that yeah, kind of yeah, very much so. Very much so. When you, um, we do a lot of work with the Regional Employment Skills Partnership in in, in South West Wales, and. Uh, in a way, curriculum now feels very disjointed. Well, we need to put a bit of this in and we need to put a bit of that in and we need to put a bit of this in and they need this skills. And all of a sudden it becomes this monster when there is a need in there, I think, for more generic skills that go right across the board. And maybe and I, 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 we're reflecting on this now as, as we try to get our students through uh, qualifications. I can see situations where more students are coming back to adult learning in the evening to maybe develop some of the specific skills. So our, our vocational students this summer hopefully will get a qualification but they're probably not as skilled as maybe the students were two or three years ago which means next year whether in university or still at the college maybe they've got to do some bite-sized courses in evenings or weekends to develop the skills whereas the important part of education for me at the moment is this more generic uh, skills learning from each other 
catching up with tutors uh, and a huge focus, Tim alluded to at the end, around well-being. That's my biggest worry at the moment. It isn't whether the students will pass their qualifications. It's how are they coping with the current challenges? And I think as educators, we've got a, a big role to do that. And for me, that's higher up my list than teaching them how to pass the course. I think that's a really interesting perspective, actually, and a really interesting point uh, there that the, I think we, we've all seen through the, through the pandemic, the value of what education is all about and the value, particularly in this week, for, for young people and children's mental health week as well. And that's, really, that's incredibly important. Um, thanks, Mark. I will come back to you in a minute, if that's OK. But I was going to um, ask Maggie Galliers now to um, to give her reflections as the chair of the Learning Work Institute in what is our 100th year, 100th year anniversary, as Jeff touched on previously. But specifically Maggie I think Tim finished by talking about education is a lifelong universal need um, and how we can kind of see 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 the challenge around around education lifelong learning in the same way that we saw um, at, the, at the end of the second world war the challenge of the welfare state and the NHS and I just kind of wondered you know if, if, if you know firstly for your reflections on the lecture but also um, if you if you if we were if you were asked by the government or governments um, across the UK to commission a work similar to that that we saw at the end of the First World War around the value of, ad of adult education, the role of adult education. What are the kind of priorities do you, do you think government should look to address for the next kind of 100 years of, um, of um, adult learning? Okay, um, thanks very much, David. And thank you, Tim, for what I thought was a very stimulating and interesting lecture that, that chimed a lot with my own experience, both historically as an FE college principal and now working across the education landscape of FE and HE. Um, uh, our vision at the Learning and Work Institute is for a prosperous and fair society in which learning and work provide opportunities for everyone to realize their potential and ambitions throughout life. So um, taking up the challenge that David set me around the 2021 report uh, from the government, I, I think there would be another, a number of key issues that resonate with that vision uh, and resonate more than I'd like to think with the past. Um, and some of them even more important now in the context of coronavirus and indeed of Brexit. So I would think that such a report would have to uh, span the whole landscape of learning. Uh, of course, include um, learning for employment. It, there is a shortage of skills, particularly at levels four and five for our economy. Um, but there is also the need for individuals to access good work, work which is going to lead somewhere. Uh, and the education that's necessary for them to do that and then to make progress within their workplace environments. And secondly, I think such a report would need to look at learning for citizenship and for social inclusion and for social justice. Um, we have, according to our latest adult participation survey and other sources of evidence, some 9 million people across the United Kingdom who still have low literacy and numeracy standards. And that cannot be good for social inclusion and for social justice. And indeed, for one of the things that Raymond Williams himself was very concerned about, learning for uh, democracy. Um, and we're still coming to terms, aren't we, with what this pandemic will have done to erode the progress that had been being made on the gap between those from the more deprived um, uh, areas and those from more affluent areas. And I think some of the early indicators are that much of that progress um, has been lost and will need to be made up again. And then finally, I think, that uh, the theme uh, that need, would need to, to follow on in such a report would be learning for individual enrichment, for health, mental health, physical health, and for individuals to realise their full potential. And I would like to the report to address how all this knits together and what kinds of policies would need to be created um, to ensure that climbing frame of opportunity that seems to have um, come across quite strongly from Tim's lecture. 
um, and, and one that I certainly recognise um, from both the FE and the OU world, people stepping on and off at different times in their lives. Our students cannot be um, easily pigeonholed and um, uh, their lives will change and there will be crossroads and they will need to step on and off as, as uh, uh, their, the rest of their lives allow. So something about how it all knits together, something about how you create that uh, climbing frame and what infrastructure is needed to, de to deliver high quality and equitable provision right across the UK. And, and finally, what the balance of investment should be expected between the state, the employer and the individual, because in the end of the day, none of this learning comes free. And we have to decide what priorities we have, both as uh, taxpayers and as employers and as individuals in our own right. So that's my take on what such a report would need to address. Thanks, Maggie. And I think you, you touched on it a little bit in your answer there, but as a couple of questions have come in around, um, we're, we're focusing here around kind of level three plus to a certain extent, uh, but there's obviously, um, the, question from Catherine Robson from um, Adult Learning Wales and another one from another um, contributor is anonymous. Just saying you know, for, for, for lots of learners, level three feels quite far out of reach to them at the moment. Um, you know, we're talking about a kind of climbing climbing frame, you know, how do we how do we support those at entry level? And what and you talk about the balance of priorities. Where in the where in the balance of priorities for investment should should kind of you know community access and level you know um, entry levels level one etc sit within that you think uh, i mean that's a really interesting question and i was once asked that by george osborne oddly uh, and and all the evidence would seem to suggest that at the, the higher levels the most return is to the individual and so the implication would be that uh, at the lower levels where the return is 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 uh, very much to society and the economy as a whole is where the taxpayer ought to put their investment. Um, but I, it would be interesting to see what Tim's take on that would be. <laughs> I think we will come back to Tim on that. And also I may, I may come back to Kirsty on that as well. Uh, but thanks for that, Maggie. Um, I'm going to bring now um, Emma into um, the discussion. I'm really pleased Emma's with us today. Um, I think as Jeff said, we've not had the and Jeff Mayer said we've not had the chance to celebrate Emma's um, award this year. We would normally have a big ceremony, and um, Emma's our overall winner this year of the Inspire Award, along with a number of other winners of individual categories. And um, we have normally had the opportunity to, um, you know, kind of celebrate uh, your story, Emma. Um, so, so there'll be a lot of people here who don't really know your your story. I don't know if you wouldn't mind just kind of. I think you you will do the introduction far better than I will. So don't you mind just touching a little bit on your kind of educational journey. I know you've got a new role this week as well, which um, you were talk, we were talking about earlier on, but I don't know if you want to just touch a little bit on, on kind of how you've got here. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for asking me to be part of this. Um, it's, it's an honor, really it is. And um, thank you very much for the lecture, Professor Blackman. I've got lots of notes here too. And um, I've kind of like gone circle from going back into learning I'm now being a teacher and, and delivering lectures online with no interaction and um, it's much more difficult um, so I, I really really did hang on to every word and um, yeah I didn't really have the um, background that I've been able to provide so, so, so my daughter who is just currently doing her, her A levels and going into uh, university generally as um, an 18 19 year old because um you know, I didn't, I was, I was homeless at a young age, my family breakdown, um, I made a lot of wrong decisions, I became addicted to drugs and alcohol for 17 years, and I came into recovery, I'm in, in my 10th year of recovery now, so, you know, me learning, you know, first the self-belief that I can achieve, and, and then going through, I'm in my sixth year now of, of higher education, um, you know, it wasn't something that I saw around me, and that I was given the opportunity to you know, have a secure home as a youngster where I was able to thrive and, and do things the way that, you know, I've come full circle and been able to be that example to my own daughter through through doing it as, a, as an adult. Um, so, yeah, I've gone from um, living on the streets to lecturing in a university in the last nine, ten years. And um, 
I uh, I took some notes. You know, I I see the social worth aspect of what you spoke about was 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 brilliant. You know, I've gone from being being able to, you know, just always looking at the floor and being ashamed of who I was to to, to having that social worth through my education, and um, you know, being able to carry that 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 hope onto other adult learners who are now my learners that. You know we can uh, overcome um, adversity, but I think the most important thing is um, is to be that that example really. Like um, what was mentioned before, my little sister who's eight years younger, um, she didn't have the child that I had, <laughs> but um, you know she had children young, and she's in her third year of a psychology degree through the Open University. Um, and, and, and I think that that's from, um, my daughter has gone straight from school, A-levels, she's doing her A-levels in amongst all this chaos, but she's still applied to universities to be a children's nurse. Um, and just, I think it's what people see. I think it's, you know, in them deprived areas or where people may not think that higher, further and higher education is a um, option for them. If they, they it's, it's what people see. And I really like the way you touched on the humanistic um, aspect of, of of all this stuff right the way through your talk because um you know i think that, that that our relationships with others and what we see other people doing is the most important thing and if we can see people doing and achieving and better in their lives then we're more likely to go and think well how do i get on an access course how do i um look into a foundation year on on, on a degree maybe i don't need to be have A stars at, at A level and, and and maybe if they're doing it, I can do it. Um, and and I, I believe that seeing that in action is, is the most important part. And then having the courage to make them calls or send them emails and say, you know, how can I get into education myself? How can I get myself up to that level three where I can actually um, get onto a foundation year, which I think foundation years are a really important thing. And Wales is coming on so well with them um, for degrees. And, and, you know, it may only be a year access course. And how can I get funding to do my access course so I can get these, I can get into university without having had the um, typical education that, that some people um, are able to have around them as an example in their family. And some people aren't, you know, and there's lots of deprived areas in Wales. I'm the granddaughter and great granddaughter of coal miners in Wales, um, you know, and I'm the first person in my family to have gone to university ever. Um, and now for, 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 I work two jobs, my daughter works two jobs. Um, and for her seeing that within the home, it's just automatic to her because she's had an example around her of, of, of how that is possible. Um, and I think in more deprived areas and communities, um, they need to see it. People need to see it in action. And I think that's the most powerful, powerful uh, vessel for people to believe that they can achieve themselves. No, that's right. And I think um, there's lots in there, I think, Emma, from what you just said there. And I think uh, I was interested in you talked about foundation and about access programmes. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you have the minister on the call. Uh, you have a vice chancellor university. Hopefully you have some other um, people listening who are educators and decision makers in education. And what, what are the kind of couple of things you would say are the most important things from your own story? Uh, perhaps maybe you've already talked about it with access and things, but what are the most important things that you would want them to take away from, from your journey? I, I think that people who come in later, later on in life don't have... For me, I ended up like age 32 after, a, you know, a, a life of hell and, and a belief system which told me I'd never amount to anything, never mind get into university. And I'm sitting amongst young, younger people who turned out to be really good friends with me, but I instantly felt less than because I thought they're cleverer than me. They can do chemistry. They can do maths. They can do this. And, and it was, you know, it was my program of recovery as well, really, that, that, that gave me the courage to turn up every day and, 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 and not give in before the miracle happened and before I felt part of on the same level as, as these people who had done it differently to me. And for me to realize, you know, when I walked over that stage, I graduated with a BSc honors in forensic science in 2018. I graduated as a teacher with a PGCE in 2019, and I will hopefully graduate with a master's of research at the end of this year. Um, and, you know, but it took time, you know, it took a lot, it took a long time for me to realize that I was, regardless of having them entry level qualifications, that I was as good as the, the rest of the people who had done it the, a different way to me. 
Um, and I and I think that it, you know that that coming in from a, a background whatever that may be, we lack confidence in our ability to achieve. Um, and and there were lots of times when I wanted to give up. And I think it's really important to provide the support to people who 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 may struggle with that confidence and 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 not only not try but try and then go I can't do this. This is too hard. You know because we can we can with the right support and examples and and guidance around us we can be whatever we want to be. I mean, I look out now over the streets where I used to just wander around homeless and, and, and stuff and, you know, and I'm, and, I'm a lect and I'm lecturing in the university and it's like, that didn't happen overnight. You know, that happened with people around me believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. I think mean, that's incredibly powerful. And um, I think if, if we could give a virtual round of applause, we would do, I think, Emma, to your story. <laughs> also, you, you know, you haven't really touched on, but you also, I think, care worker as well during the crisis oh yeah so and i lost another role as well now as well i think haven't you with them um, yeah it's a mixed bag at the moment so i lost my I, I graduated as a teacher and i was and i was i was awarded a contract to delivering a module at the university where i was a student and then covid happened so that all went online and then obviously i wasn't i wasn't i wasn't given any more work as a teacher because there wasn't any um, but what what happened is I've kept my I've been able to keep my job as a key worker, which I did all the way through my university, and now look after a vulnerable adult in his in his own home. And you know it's not teaching, and my plans have been restricted a bit with this COVID thing. But I'm grateful to have a job, and um, when many people haven't, and um, and I do know that if I keep chipping away, and um, you know the the teaching opportunities and the employment opportunities for me doing what I want to do, you know. In empowering other people to, to change but they will happen but it's just gone a bit backwards at the moment but then I'll finish on this um yeah I've just been um asked to volunteer with regards to the COVID crisis at the post-mortem room in um Glanford Hospital and I know that's not for everybody but when you're obsessed with forensic pathology you're a graduate of forensic science you teach about postmortems, and um, you know for me that is really a really really big step and, and the social work aspect of of little old me be, being asked to step up in this crisis um, you know it's just it's just really overwhelming um, I'm so grateful for my education to you know to give me that 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 self-worth oh, thanks Emma and um, if, if you looked on slide over the, there's lots of comments and questions for you on slide over some uh, I don't know where that is <laughs> all I can say is that there's lots of praise for you um, for your story so Thank you for sharing that. I know it's um, really important that we have that learner voice in these uh, conversations. Um, I think we've also given Tim long enough now to um, <laughs> get his breath back after the lecture. Um, and I just, uh, Tim, there's lots of questions uh, on the chat for you. Um, and um, I'll, I'll try and sort of pick on some of them if I can, um, so that people who are making comments on the lecture have got their opportunity. And I think, um, one of the one of the interesting questions um, around uh, you talk about common collective experience and 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 just just how hard that is to do if we want to have a you know a collective common experience and, and the importance of that um, for our society how do we achieve that in the modern era when we, there, there is no longer a, a kind of collective industry there's arguably no longer collective sources of information and media you know do, do we do, are, are we able to achieve Raymond Williams's vision? in the context of a kind of a far more fragmented um, society and workplaces. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> and th thanks for all that feedback, David, Kirsty, Mark, Maggie, Emma. Emma, what a powerful story. Um, and thanks for all the questions coming in. Um, I, I, I guess the fundamental point I'm trying to make is that learning together uh, rather than separately is 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 really important. Um, students with different backgrounds learning together, students learning different subjects together, mixed abilities, um, and that's why I, I see comprehensive education systems are so important. Um, so I think that that's part of the answer. You know, let's let's continue to promote and defend the principle of comprehensive education. Um, I think that can enable us to bring together students on different learning pathways, learning technology, humanities, and not necessarily always moving up the education ladder. I talked about climbing frames, you know, we, we'll shift levels, go up, go down according to what we need. And the system needs to support that and recognize it all of, as a value and worth. And I suppose briefly the, 
the, the other point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we're asking ourselves, what is education for? Well, yeah, it is for ourselves, but it's also for others, for each other. It's the job we do, but it's the job other people do for us. You know, it's, it's the delivery driver bringing the Amazon order to a teacher, and it's the teacher teaching that delivery driver's kids at school. You know, that, 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 that's, um, that reciprocity is, is what I'm, I'm saying is such an important foundational principle. Um, so it's learning together, not apart. It's, it's being comprehensive. Um, and I think just to touch on the point about who pays for all this, um, yeah, I think it's right that, that probably the higher up the education system you go, the, the, the bigger the, the individual or student or graduate contribution, but that can be done in various ways. It can be done through the tax system. And, and the last point I just want to make right now is that you know, this is about paying for a valuable product. It's not some kind of service that's feeding off wealth creation elsewhere in the economy. This is wealth creation. Education is wealth creation. Uh, it's a valuable product that we do need to pay for. But you know, th that's the point. It's not paid for by taxes are a way of paying for it. But the issue is how much of it do we want to pay for? Um, and um, uh, that those are my points really that, that this is a collective enterprise we, we should look to fund it collectively um, and we should see this as an investment in our future a sustainable future and we should see it as uh, spending on something that is immensely valuable and creates wealth okay um and that's really, I think there's an, an, another question that's come in from um, Jeremy Gass. Um, I, I, think, I think it's related to this um, in part, um, where he says, um, Williams defined his social purpose as the creation of an educated and participating democracy. Are there any signs of this purpose in education today? And I know this is partly what he touched on, and there may be other different answers in different nations of the UK as well, potentially, but I want to any reflections around, you know, whether education is delivering that. Um, in terms of the democratic process? Um, so, so I think this is at, at risk. Um, you know, I, I, I support the technical education agenda in England because, it, because you know, livelihoods are really important and people need the education and the training to, to have decent jobs. Um, and that, that's, of course, true across the UK. But the content of that training needs to include what we could call generally the humanities. And similarly, studying humanities at university should involve developing some skills and competencies to actually have a livelihood. Um, but uh, what we're lacking, I think, is the emphasis that Raymond Williams certainly would want us to see on this development of this critical consciousness. Um, it is so important at the moment with the spread of disinformation powered by social media. It's a, it's, it, it's a phenomenon that we haven't seen before. Um, so critical consciousness is important in every education and training program. Um, it's learning for democracy, as Maggie put it. Um, and it's learning and democracy as common experiences, uh, bringing together the somewheres and anywheres about a common democratic objective and a common learning experience. Um, so yes, I think we are in, in some parts of the UK more than others, um, neglecting the importance of this liberal education for critical consciousness, because our democracy will fall apart if we don't give it more attention. Tim, I think we've lost Dave and he's dropped out. So I think we're going to ask um, Jeff if he'd take over the, the chair at this moment. Jeff? I think internet problems getting the better of, no, of just very... imagine, sorry thanks jeff yep thank you thank you for that tim thank you for your um your comments around that um could i pose the same question to the panel to get um uh, an overall uh, perspective on on this and and clearly i think kirsty um mm -hmm. uh there are questions around uh the welsh government approach to uh, technical education and you know the liberal arts etc so could I have your comments on that first and then we'll go to Mark Jones from a practitioner's perspective. Sure, of course, Jeff. Um, I think, you know, that 
that that principle of educating for a democracy, you know, is uh, part of why we're reforming um, a compulsory education. Uh, uh, one of the purposes of the new curriculum was be is to uh, ensure that uh, people leaving uh, our education, you know, our compulsory part of our education system, are ethical, informed citizens of Wales and the world, ready to play a full life uh, in the com in, in, in play a full part in the life of their community uh, and of their country. Uh, I think it's why we have um, uh, always um, made sure that there is an element of universalism uh, mm -hmm. within a progressive system of supporting um, uh, student support. Um, uh, Tim made the comment about um, uh, maintenance. The average Welsh student will receive this year a maintenance grant, not a loan, but a non-repayable maintenance grant for living costs of seven and a half thousand pounds. It's why we've always resisted calls to, to cap uh, our student support system to students who, who reside in Wales and only decide to study in Wales. You know, and there is an, an element uh, within the Senate that thinks that we should not be funding people to go to university anywhere else other than in Wales. And I've always resisted that because I think it is so important uh, that Welsh uh, uh, young people should be able to study uh, across the United Kingdom and in, in, in indeed uh, uh, in other places. Um, it's why it's why you know we've always resisted calls of funding certain courses. Again, there's a school of thought within the Senate that we should only be funding certain courses that are seen as useful to society. Well, as someone with a degree in American studies, you know, I suspect mm -hmm. they would regard that as not being a useful degree. Although I should point out that there are two members of the cabinet that have degrees in American studies. And back to the theme of classics, the first minister has a degree in Latin. So, uh, you know, <laughs> who, who makes these decisions about, you know, what is you know, what learning is valuable and what not valuable. And that's why we've always, you know, had that universalism in, in our approach to studying. That's why we're desperately looking to find new ways of supporting a Welsh version of Erasmus Plus. Um, you know, the Turing scheme that has been proposed in England mm -hmm. will be fine for your undergraduate student once who's, you know, who's studying a foreign language. What the Turing scheme is not fine for is your is, you, is your child who is a member of the Young Farmers Club here in Mid Wales, who has never gone to university, doesn't want to go to university, but has used the Erasmus scheme to partner up and to meet young farmers in other parts of rural Europe to discuss the future of rural communities and, and how they live their lives. Or the soccer team in Llandrin Dodd Wells, you know, who gets to play soccer in Germany and for whom mm. those children would never have had the opportunity to move outside particularly, you know, Clandrindod, let's be honest. So, you know, that idea of, you, of, of education in all its forms as being able to build, you know, the, uh, education for democracy. I think there's a challenge. You know, we talked, to, we heard from Emma, didn't we, about the courage needed to step through the threshold, you know, just to simply go through that door into those institutions. You know, I think we've made great progress this year, at least over these last couple of years, with a sense of higher education civic mission. You know, you're to, you know, institutions that not just serve the purposes of the students that attend them, but are institutions of their place and serve the communities in which they are located. I um, mean, the Open University has always done that, but you know, can the same be said for some of our other institutions? And I think we've seen great progress uh, in being able to do, to do that. So the university isn't just about the people who attend there, but that university delivers good in the community that it is uh, located uh, located in. Uh, I think, you know, the question about where's the balance, you know, uh, I think, you know, um, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or. I think, you know, government has a role to play, yes, in supporting access to postgraduate study. Uh, but I think obviously, you know, we have a role and responsibility for promoting access into informal learning that actually doesn't create necessarily a formal qualification at the end of it, because it is the gateway that that person needs perhaps to move on uh, on to that. So, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or. We're trying to spread the resources that we have got, you know, across the, the gamut of learning opportunities. And um, I'm, I'm with Tim, you know, I would say as an education minister, you know, um, sometimes, you know, um, we have to make the case that uh, we're paying for a very, very important service and, you know, and perhaps 
you know, a greater level of discussion of what is an adequate uh, amount of funding to go into education mm. systems is something that all governments need to have. Thank you, Minister. I'm so pleased that we're trying to keep that balance here in Wales with the Liberal uh, Social Democracy as well as the, the technical piece. I'll, I had asked the question for Mark Jones, so if Mark could take his question then, and Dave, welcome back, I'll butt out now and uh, leave it to you. Well, I wouldn't disagree with it either, um, Jeff. I, I suppose where it goes wrong is the links between different institutions. So, so for example, if I want, um, as this lecture has been going on, we just had notification from Cambridge and Oxford on how many of Carroll College Swansea students have got in uh, next year. Now, they're not up for liberal education. They just want the brightest kids in their particular subject. Uh, and when our 16-year-olds arrive, we know if they haven't had a, uh, an A, uh, GCSE, then they'll struggle to get into those top universities. And it just feels as if it's a, it's a strange discussion. There's plenty of potential. And the story is incredible. The story is there. a well-deserving um, well winner of, of this year's award. But there were so many people who boom late. And at the moment, um, I just feel we're on a bit of a treadmill when we need to take a step back and Crucially for me, we need to get the different institutions, the schools, the colleges, the universities talking together to find that smooth pathway that recognises someone's um, wider skill base and gives them the same opportunity. Where at the moment it, it feels like it's more of, a, more of a rush, more of a treadmill, particularly at 16 to 18 years of age. They've got to come in with the best UCSE results, which gives them the best chance of getting on to the best universities. And that's a small number of individuals, and yet that's what we seem to be focused on. So I, I think I wouldn't disagree with anything that's said. I, I just think there's something we need to do about talking together to find those pathways uh, and make it more uh, open for pupils of all different skills and, and of abilities to achieve whatever they want to do. Thanks, Mark. And yeah, apologies for dropping out there, everyone. Um, challenge of doing this remotely. Um, I, just, uh, I want to bring Maggie back in, um, if I can, really. Um, although we've talked a little bit about the Welsh context, uh, but obviously, Tim, you are kind of the vice chancellor for you, know, you across the UK. So I'd just be interested in Maggie's perspective, um, from learning and works point of view, at least anyway, is how far do you feel we are away from the kind of vision which Tim has set out um, in, in the context of England? How far away are we, do you think we are from that in England? In terms of the value we place on um, education, particularly for adults in the system, I mean, if you, you know, how far have we got to travel? Do you think in England? I mean, unfortunately, I think there is a lot of ground to be made up. Um, I mean, for utilitarian reasons, I think there has been a huge emphasis um, on uh, funding that which is seen to be useful to the economy. I think what Tim referred to as uh, you know, engineering, not media studies. Um, and, and I think um, there is um, an artificial divide between the technical and the academic. Uh, my observation is that for many technical jobs, you need to have underpinning knowledge. You need to have academic skills to analyze, to dissect, uh, to, to uh, transfer. Uh, and and um, it isn't fully appreciated that it's not just a system of vocational competencies. Um, you need to do what William Morris and, and John Ruskin called uniting the heart, the hand and, and the mind. Uh, and um, one of the things that I like to quote um, is that uh, when I was a principal of an FE college, a number of my students competed in the World Skills Olympics and came back with medals, um, silver medals, even a gold in one case. And I will say to you that all those students that competed and achieved at world class levels um, had eight GCSEs. Uh, but instead of being advised to take a, 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 a progression pathway that through A-levels and so on, they came from families where uh, the vocational pathways were valued and they were able to bring to their skill set not only um, a, a competence with their hands, 
but also they could bring their hearts and their minds to the task. And I think the artificial divide that we have, um, you know, you've got this set of qualifications, therefore you go in this direction. You've got no qualifications, therefore you go in this direction. Um, is really a very artificial one. And we're seeing, aren't we, that um, uh, the lack of investment um, uh, throughout lifelong learning is, is starting to take its toll now. I absolutely can agree more on that one. I think that it's a kind of decade of underinvestment and perhaps longer in lifelong learning is really having an impact. Um, conscious of time, and there's lots of questions I haven't um, asked. Um, let's get back to Tim, if I can. Um, a couple of questions that have come up. One, I think, which um, I think has come up from a number of people in, in the chat, which is this kind of what you what you didn't do was potentially link, um, which, which is important for Evan Williams, which was to link his his kind of views to socialism. That you know, very very much kind of a key part of his of his thought process. We can just comment on on that as part of your the part of your contribution. But also, um, one of the questions which has come in, which is um, you talked about usefulness of education, and I suppose the important thing is who defines what is useful. Um, is it you know government institution? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I suppose the last point is back to to Williams is. Um, preoccupation with democracy you know that, that this is about our democratic processes um yeah I mean, uh, Williams was a socialist intellectual um but I think what's important to recognize is that he sought to win his arguments through reasoning uh and evidence um and uh, it was very wary of indoctrination of ideological indoctrination in education. You know, I use that Cobbett quote that he, he quoted as a as a warning. Um, so um, for sure, uh, there's a socialist agenda there. Um, uh, but um, I, I think the important thing is to, to hear the arguments and arrive at our own view on whether those arguments are the kind of society we think we want to be part of and to to build. Um, and uh, I suppose I, I'll, I'll fit this point in now because it's come out of the conversation generally. I think diversity needs to be a more active planning pr principle in our education system. We, we've built education systems that stratify um, intentionally or unintentionally um, when there's tons of evidence that um, diversity creates uh, better problem solving companies with diverse boards do better, education environments that are diverse raise everybody's game. And I think um, one thing I'm going to take away from this is how can we think through diversity as being a more active planning principle in our education systems? Um, and uh, that will enable us to respond to the things Williams warns us about, call it socialist or not, but growing inequality, uh, ecological catastrophe, um, unhappiness, um, these are the things he warned us about. He 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 was amazingly forward-looking. I mean, I went back to his lot of lot of his work to prepare for this lecture, and it, you know, and I regard myself as fairly familiar with a lot of his writing, and and I was just surprised by how much he saw of what was coming, disinformation, um, the wealth in capital growing while wages stagnate, um, and um, a a relegating of things that are fundamental to our well-being and our relationships in the interests of short-term uh, economic competitive advantage um and i think finally you know he, he very much brought together the socialist and green agendas and i think that has a very profound message for us that um we have to avoid this mindset where we we regard people and the environment as raw material to be exploited um we need a uh, uh, a relationship with others, a relationship with the environment that invests in its sustainability for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for that. And thank you for bringing us to that point in the in the lecture. I'd also like to thank the, the panel, um, Kirsty, Maggie, Mark, Emma, um, for your contributions this afternoon. And, um, and move on to Louise Casella, who is the director of um, Open University in Wales for Louise to give us a summary and some some closing remarks. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and, and, and thanks, everyone. As, as Jeff said, um, I'm Luce Casella, director of the Open University in Wales, and, and can I add my thanks to, to Tim for giving the lecture today? It was really fascinating and thought-provoking critique and celebration of, of Raymond Williams' thinking, his legacy, and indeed where we are today. Much food for, the, for thought there for educators and policy, policy makers alike. Um, thanks to, of course, to, to Maggie, who both at the OU and Learning and Work Institute are lucky to have as part of our teams. Emma, for the, for the inspiration and example in, inherent in your story and actions, and Mark, for your reflections, a reminder that we've been deep in a year of um, how and need to hang on to, to the what and why of what we do. We really appreciate all of you having been part of today's events to share your unique perspectives and experiences. I'd also like to thank Dave and everyone from the Learning and Work team for working with us once again to put on this special event. We at the OU in Wales are really proud of the relationship we have with you and working together on the Raymond Williams Lecture is always a pleasure. Finally, but by no means least, can I thank the Education Minister Kirsty Williams for being with us today. Minister, we appreciate very much the way in which you've worked with us at the OU and in the wider learning community to start to really change the way we think about learning here in Wales. Of course, from the OU's point of view, we, we, we often emphasise the reforms you drove to student finance, which now mean that part-time study is a realistic prospect for thousands more people in Wales. And we've already seen the positive impact of this with continued growth in the number of people choosing to study with the OU since the new system was brought in. But we also applaud and support the curriculum changes for schools that will challenge and develop a different kind of learning in Wales. Changes which perhaps Raymond Williams would have welcomed too. And your drive to ensure that tertiary education is a more fluid and seamless progression for all. Reforms which should reap real and sustained long term benefits for Wales, not just for the current but for future generations too. Wells has been very fortunate to have as our education minister someone who's been willing to take the long view and to press for the best thinking and ideas to be brought into policy making. I know you've got your hands very full at the moment, Minister, an understatement perhaps, but after May, I hope perhaps you, as you consider your next steps in life beyond the Senate, you might be able to reflect on what significant achievements your reforms to the part-time funding system have been for adult and lifelong learnings. Maybe you can take advantage of them yourself if you're considering new paths. It would be absolutely remiss of me not to recommend the OU's free online learning platform, OpenLearn. Um, come and learn with us, <laughs> every subject under the sun available. But in all seriousness, Minister, we thank you for your support and for all of your work to open up education to so many more people and send you our best wishes for the future. In his lecture, Tim referred to Raymond Williams's view of education as a vehicle for social change. Indeed, at the start of his lecture, Tim referred to the term used by Williams himself, the process of society as itself a process of education. And I think that's a perfect description of what we're all striving to do. And in these uncertain and challenging times, I also think that description offers some hope for the future. Over the past year or so, and like you, I'm sure I can't quite believe it's been a year, we've seen thousands of people across Wales turning to learning to keep them going to get them through. Because while the subject matter at hand is valuable in its own right, and I do believe that any learning is valuable, whatever its nature or pur purpose, we also know that learning brings with it much wider benefits. It opens minds and horizons. It helps maintain our mental health and well-being. It offers us new skills and knowledge, and it gives us experiences that we had never thought possible. The more of us who have the opportunity to learn, the more we are all able to play our part as active citizens, members of communities, our local communities, our national life and on the world stage. The more of us who have the opportunity to learn, the better we all understand the world around us, what drives people, what powers an economy and what fosters cohesion, tolerance and respect. The more of us who have the opportunity to learn, the better we all become each of us able and empowered to affect positive change, to make our voices heard and to play our part in building, as we at the OU put it, a brave new Wales. Of course, what we're talking about is the civic nature of education. Its purpose is as much for one as it is for all. Its benefits reaped more, more widely than one person, one household, one business, or even one community its transformational power felt more strongly than one generation 
but by all the generations that follow. And it's in that spirit we can all redouble our efforts to open up learning to everyone in Wales. Now more than ever in the lifetimes of any of us, we need to see education as the inextricable component of our shared mission to improve society. So in conclusion, thank you again, Tim, for your lecture today and for the provocation it delivered and to our panel members for the lively discussion. And thank you on behalf of all of us at the OU to the Learning and Work Institute in your centenary year for all the work that you do to champion lifelong learning and challenge us as providers, policymakers and employers to best support the individual for the benefit of society. The Welsh proverb has it, Nerth Glad Agobodaeth, a country's strength is in her learning. We look forward to continuing to work with all of you to build that strength towards a progressive and fair future. Minister, participants and attendees, thank you all of, for joining us from wherever you may be and for being part of this event and for being part of the conversation. Diolch Bau. And thank you, Louise, for that. Um, thank you, Louise, for that um, for that closing message. So can I just sort of echo your thanks to, to Tim for that stimulating and uh, engaging uh, lecture. And thanks to the, the panel, the minister. And um, we're very fortunate in Wales to have a, a minister and to have uh, a Welsh government that still have hold those um, principles of Raymond Williams at heart. So I think we're very fortunate here and we're very fortunate to have participants such as yourselves who are so keen, so interested and so willing to share your thoughts. So thank you all. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, it's lunchtime, so enjoy your lunch. And we look forward to see you next year for the Raymond Williams Lecture uh, next year. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>